All right, now keep a, keep a bookmark or a finger or a place here in James chapter 2. It's a very relevant chapter for what we're going to be teaching tonight. We're going to come back to this a little bit later in the sermon. So there's some places that we're going to look to first. And basically what I'm preaching about tonight is, is sort of like a continuation of this morning's sermon. This morning I preached about God being the just judge and, and what is justice and what is righteous and how we ought to be following the pattern that God gave us to understand what's righteous, what's just, what our law should be and what type of judgment we should be using. Okay, now this is a very similar topic, but I'm going to be talking about ways that judgment and justice is perverted, is switched, is changed, and some of the, the various things that people can be doing or, or have um, that will influence their decision making and their judgments to make them perverted, to make them false. And these are things that we need to be looking out for in ourselves when we are casting judgment, when we are judging things, because look, everybody judges. Especially the people that say, judge not. Okay, they judge also. They're judging you when they condemn you and say, oh, you're not supposed to judge. That is a judgment. We all need to make judgment. There's nothing wrong with making a judgment, but we need to make sure that our judgment is just. That our judgment is right. And there are things that we can do. Now, most of these that we're going to be going over, I've got four points they apply more towards a person that is in authority like a judge, like someone who is going to be giving, you know, uh, judging between two people you know, in the law or whatever. People have a case against them. However, you need to keep this in mind because as a biblical church, a New Testament church, we are to judge matters as a church within the church. We don't take things to the law. So there are a lot, there are going to be areas where, and I know we're really small right now, but it's good doctrine to learn and things that we're going to need to keep in mind so that we can, keep, we can have a just judgment. You know, that we could find who is esteemed least in the church to be a judge over such matters, as we saw in 1 Corinthians in our Bible study, right? When, when we don't take a brother to law when we have disputes among each other, because well, problems eventually will arise within the church. It's going to happen when you just get, especially as you grow and you get more people in the church, someone is bound to do wrong to someone else. And none of us is perfect. Somebody will end up doing wrong. And, and you think about it, you know, we should be having people at all different stages of their spiritual growth. Some people hopefully will be brand new believers and we're just starting to teach and train them all the way up the ladder to people who are much more spiritual in their growth. But, um, and as a result, especially with newer believers, it's going to be even more likely that you're going to have someone that does wrong to you. So we need to make sure, you know, I'm just saying that so that you pay attention and, and make sure that you can keep a good head and, 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 and be able to have proper judgment and discernment in what we're doing and that you don't let any of these things pervert your judgment. Okay, and also so that you can view someone, as I mentioned this morning, like if you do vote for people to rule over you, that you can look at these aspects and these qualities or these, these things that, that can pervert judgment and say, wow, is this person, is their, is their judgment perverted? Based on some of the things that we're going to look at today. First, we'll just look at, at just judgment. I, I'll just read this for you. You don't have to turn there. In John chapter 5, verse number 30, and this basically reiterates this morning's sermon, Jesus Christ said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Why is your judgment just, Jesus? Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. That is why, the, and that's why for all of us, if we're going to have a just judgment, it's going to be because it's according to God's will and not our own. See, way too many times a, a judge will not be impartial. They'll be partial to somebody. They'll be partial to the outcome of a situation in one way or another. And if you're seeking your own will, well, I think that this is the way things ought to be because, it's your, you know, because maybe somehow you'll benefit from it. Now, all of a sudden, your judgment is unjust. It's, it's perverted. It's skewed. But when you are being able to take a situation and make a judgment and say, you know what? The Lord's will be done. What does God say is the right just, justice or judgment for this matter? 
That is a just judgment then to take. And you, may, you know, in the church, it may come up where, well, this person's my friend. We're really good friends. But if your friend maybe is in the wrong, your friend is, the, is one that, um, that has done wrong, and, and a just judgment would say, yeah, you know what, you are wrong, and you need to, to, to you know, recompense the other person or whatever the case may be. You need to keep your own will out of it because your own will might be like, man, this is my friend. I don't, you know, like I like them and I, and I want to be able to, to help them out and be there for them and kind of stick up for them. But if you're going to be a just judge in a matter, you have to be able to dissociate that from yourself and be able to say, you know what, this is God's will and this is the way that we're going to judge. And that's why Jesus' judgment was all just because everything that he did and everything that he promoted and everything that he taught was according to the Lord's will. And what's really interesting about that, and we're not going to get into this at all really tonight, is how Jesus Christ as a human being on this earth, everything he did was righteous, he was without sin, yet he had a separate will and was capable of having a separate will. He always kept his will in line with the Father. But you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, you know, if there's any other way that we can do this, God, you know, I, I don't want to have to go to the cross and, and do this. Now, he said, he said, I'm willing to do it. I will do this. But if there is any other way, then let's do it another way. You know, and he had that desire, but of course he was willing and obedient according to God's will, and he was able to put his own will aside, so to speak, um, in order to fulfill the will of the Father. And... Um, that's the way that the example that we need to be able to follow if we are going to be just in our judgment of anything. And you think about judgment, you know, when you judge things, you could judge sin. You can judge uh, if somebody's doing things. Another real common example would be homosexuality because there are so many people today now that either have an old friend or relative or distant, you know, somebody in their family maybe is a sodomite. And you don't want to allow that to pervert your own judgment just in the matter of what is, you know, how should we deal with this? What does God say? You know, what, what is the truth on this matter? And not to be blinded by our own um, feelings or our own relationship with somebody that, that may fall under that so that we pervert what the judgment truly should be. And again, I'm not talking about taking law in our own hands, but just even having that, the, the, the stand of, of making a vocal judgment. You know, a lot of people that are Christian, that are, that are they're saved, they believe the King James Bible and they're soul winning and everything else, do not want to take a stand of saying, yes, I believe that sodomites ought to be put to death as a punishment, legally in this land because they have family members and they just don't want to think about them being put to death. And it's clouded their judgment because that's what God says is just. And see, we need to try to make sure when we make judgments on anything that we can, we can dissociate ourselves from all of those other factors in our life and be able to make a proper just judgment in, in, as long as it's according to God's will. So the first point I want to say that, uh, of a way that people can pervert their judgment is by being a respecter of persons. When you respect one person over another for whatever that reason may be. And in some of the examples I was just bringing up, it would be because they're a close friend or a family member. So you are respecting that person more than the pro what the proper judgment would dictate. So I'll read this for you. You could turn if you want to... Um, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Keep your finger here in James 2 because like I said, we're coming back to that. Deuteronomy chapter 1. But in Leviticus 19 verse 15, the Bible says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge, thou shalt judge thy neighbor. So he's saying, look, whether they're poor or whether they're rich, whether they're this mighty ruler or whether they're just the lowest of the low. He says, don't respect the person either way. You know, don't be partial one way or the other. You need to be able to just put them both on a level playing field. 
And that's why, you know, in justice, you know, supposedly, and it's like the symbol for justice is, is the Lady Liberty that has her a blindfold on, and it's, and it's a scale, it's a balance, right, that's showing you that they're going to, you know, it's blind to, to the person, so that they're not a respecter of persons, and just able to um, judge a matter based on the merits, just based on the facts, and be able to weigh that in the balances and find out, um, you know, who's found wanting. Deuteronomy chapter 1, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me, and I will hear it. This is when Moses was, was delegating some of the judgment unto other people. And he's saying, look, you're going to judge these matters. And he had a system where he was setting up judges because the, the people were so many that he could not be the judge for everybody. So... There were certain people that are set up to be judges and say, okay, all the little things that come up, all the small matters, they should be real easy, almost like no-brainers. You guys judge those things because you're always going to have some kind of disputes between people. It comes up. And most of them are pretty easy. He says he had a system where, okay, the, the more difficult things, well, you could bring to this person. And then ultimately, if it's real difficult, to bring it to Moses. Right? Moses had a direct line with God. And he's saying, you know, if something's just, you guys can't figure it out and you don't know what is just, bring it to me. And that's the way that he did it. And what he, it, what he does here, what the Old Testament reiterates exactly what Jesus Christ said. He says um, in verse 17 there, not to be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. Because you are supposed to be the judge for God's man, for what God says is right. So obviously when someone is going to be ruled against, they're not going to have a, a good face. Right? They're not, they're not going to be looking at you very pleasantly when you, if you have to rule against somebody. And here's where the big problem comes in. Is if you have to judge a matter between someone who is maybe homeless and someone who has a lot of power and influence that they have just trampled over the rights of, of the poor and the needy. And, all, and look, this happens all the time. All the time in our society. And unfortunately, we have judges that are unjust, that are not willing to blind their eyes and not be a respecter of persons. There's very famous examples. We all know them, right? Think about the most recent Bill Cosby, right? If you're going to judge that matter, now look, I don't have all of the facts, but he's just a good example of someone that if he were to be in a court of law and you were going to be the judge, you can't be going back and thinking like, oh man, I love the Cosby show and just, you know, like, like I love him so much. He's, you know, he's this guy, he's the Jello guy, he's the Coke guy, you know, like, like he's just so, there's no way he could have done that because, because you just love him so much because he's this star versus, you know, these, these women who, you know, of course they'll try to, to tarnish their names and everything else and just, just say, oh yeah, they're, they're these lowly women. They don't, you know, whatever. They, they're just lying and everything else. Now they may be, I don't know, but what I'm saying is in order to be a just judge, you need to be able to separate that your love for, for this, this entertainer and not be a respecter of persons and not care that He's got a ton of money and he did all this other stuff that you know, made everybody else happy. And you can't be thinking about, well, what are the repercussions? Are people going to be upset about it? It doesn't matter. If you are going to make a just judgment, that is what you have to do. The consequences are what they are. The person who perpetrated the crime ought to have thought about that before they commit the crime. But it's not the judge's job to be concerned about what the aftermath is going to be. You just need to judge a matter righteously. Here's another example. How about O.J. Simpson? Right? A man that had wealth and power and influence and was able to basically buy off a jury. And that was one for the first time that, you know, where they, they televised all this stuff. And I didn't get really into it, but it's ridiculous the amount of evidence that was against him yep. and being able to get off the hook. And that just highlights what's wrong with the American justice system. And it's not necessarily the system as a whole as much as it's the judges. The judge that needs to be impartial. The judge that can't be bought off. The judge that is not a respecter of persons. 
And probably the most recent would be Hillary Clinton, another example of someone who definitely has power and influence and has been in the, in the government establishment for decades between her and her husband and has so many criminal acts that have been perpetrated by her and has not gone to prison. I mean, you, the things that she has done, if any other person that's not connected in the system would have done those things, you'd be in jail a long time ago and they'd throw away the key. But she has clout. She knows people. And people are scared of her. And that's, and that's why you know, the Bible says here, you shall not be afraid of the face of man. A just judge would not be afraid of Hillary Clinton or what she might do as a result. If you are going to make a just judgment, if you are going to stand there and say, you know what, I'm going to do God's will. I'm going to be here acting under the authority of Romans 13. And I'm going to be a just judge and it is what it is. And the consequences are the consequences, but I am not going to let anything change what a just judgment would be. And that goes for not just, a, like in our society, we've got a few people involved. It's not just necessarily the judge. You've got the prosecutors and people who have to decide whether or not they're going to bring cases against her. If we had Christians in these positions, people who actually had respect unto God's word and God's law, she'd be in prison right now. She would have been arrested. Their charges would have been filed against her from any one person that, that had the guts to stand on God's word and wanted to be just and not a respecter of persons. But what happens if anyone decides to do that? They're going to say, well, my career is over. If I act against this person, my career is over. Shame on you. Shame on you if that's what you think. You say, well, I got a family to feed. Shame on you. You're supposed to have integrity to have a job that is going to prosecute and, and judge and be a righteous judge. Shame on you. You're putting your own needs, your own family, anything above God's judgment. And you are no longer a righteous judge. Your judgment has been perverted. Psalm 82, I'll read this for you. Psalm 82, verse 1 reads, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. All too often, the poor and the needy get trampled over because they don't have any money. They have no, and especially in, in, our, in our legal system today, if you don't have money, you can't really defend yourself. You get stuck with these public defenders who are supposed to have your best interests in mind, but they don't care about you. They don't care about what you've done. You're just another number, another case, another, another workload to them that they just have to get through it. And unfortunately, that's the way it is. If there was just lawyers out there, they would be treating you just like anyone else. They wouldn't be a respecter of persons. But they know, you know they're not making that much money off of you because they're getting paid by the state or whatever, and they're not getting... Um, you know, what a, what a person would normally have. And that's why you have people like O.J. Simpson. You know, if that was a homeless guy that was caught in the same exact scenario as O.J. Simpson, they probably would have got the death penalty. Or I was in California, so they probably would have got life in prison. Right? They would have locked him up and thrown away the key. Because he didn't have the, the, he wouldn't have had the resources to hire, you know, this huge team of lawyers to come in and just try to confuse the whole matter to, just, to get him off. And it happens, and even, you know, and I don't even care where you stand on this, but, you, you know, it's, it's evidence if you've ever seen that, that documentary, that Making a Murder or whatever it's called, the Netflix documentary, you know, there's people who are, who are much poorer and without any, any means of, of being able to hire someone that's a good lawyer, you just, you just get screwed around by the system. And God knows this. And look, this is nothing new. This is nothing specific to the American justice system. This has been going on forever. This is timeless. The poor and the needy are always getting trampled on by the rich who are just greedy and trying to make another buck. And if you are going to act justly, you cannot accept the person of the wicked. You have to be able to make a proper, a righteous, a just judgment. The Bible says in John 7, 24, turn back if you would to James chapter 2. John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. People could make all kinds of a show for their appearance, but don't let that influence you. You need to be able to judge righteously. 
James chapter 2, we're going to we look through this again. We read the whole chapter before we started the sermon. James 2 verse number 1 says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of per person. So now, this is going to be more applied to our faith and how we deal with people within the church. You know, a lot of, a lot of the verses that we read, it's, it's having judgment and accepting the, the person of the wicked, you know, in, in kind of other settings. But here it's talking about the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with the respect of persons. Verse 2, For if there come unto your assembly, if there comes someone unto your church, your assembly, a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. So let's see, imagine this. Two people just walk into our church. One guy's wearing a suit, a tie, he's got a nice gold ring, maybe a nice chain around his neck, real well kept, clean looking sharp and then a homeless guy walks in right just just picture that in your head two people two men walk in the one guy's really you know, looks like a businessman right everything going for him looks wealthy and then someone else just just walks in you know tattered clothing um maybe hasn't showered in a few days whatever and look what it says and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? So then, if you just say, Oh, oh, you know, you, you kind of brush past, let's say the, the homeless guy walked in first, and you just kind of like bump shoulders, like kind of pass him, and say, Oh, here, come right here, we've got this seat for you right here, you're right up in the front row, come and sit down. We're so glad that you can be here. And he, oh, yeah, why, why don't you take that chair back in the corner over there? You know, you kind of stink a little bit. We don't want you to, to, to bother anyone that's, that's part of the congregation. Go ahead and sit back there. Or just, oh, there's no more. Yeah, go stand over there. The Bible says that that's wicked. Say so that you're partial. Right off the bat, you don't know anything about these people. And all of a sudden, you are just giving preferential treatment unto someone because they have money. Because they have money, and that's it. Because they come in, and obviously they are well, more well off than the other person, knowing nothing about them. Forgetting that Jesus Christ didn't have a home for a long time while he's ministering. He said, I don't have anywhere to lay my head. So if you would have seen Jesus Christ during some of his ministry, there's probably some times where he wasn't that clean. He probably wasn't wearing the newest of new clothing. You know, there, there, if you were to look on him as a man... And then you look on one of these Pharisees wearing the nice long robes and the goodly apparel and the rings and the jewels. How wicked would that be to just, oh, the Pharisees here, yes. And okay, Jesus, yeah, you can, you can stand back there. Maybe someone will leave and you can take their seat. That's why he's saying don't judge according to the appearance. Judge righteous judgment. You're partial in yourselves. You become judges of evil thoughts. Verse number five. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? And anyone who goes out soul winning for any amount of time knows this for a fact. When you go to the poor neighborhoods, you, when you go into the, into the ghettos where people have almost no money, you find way more people that are first willing to receive Christ as a Savior and are saved already than you do when you go into the really rich areas where the, the proud men have, have earned everything themselves and they don't want to hear anything about God. And you get doors slammed in your face and they are not neighborly, they're not loving or anything. They don't care at all about you. They don't care at all about Jesus because they made it all on their own and they have pride. But you go into the, to the poor areas, and the Bible says here, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. That's where you find people rich in faith. So if any, and look, you shouldn't be a respecter of persons either way, but what's, what's so funny about it is that people will respect the person who is way more likely to not have the faith and not be a brother in Christ than you would to the person that, that does, that, that would be more likely. The Bible teaches either way, don't be a respecter of persons. Treat them equally. Don't prefer one over the, over the other. Treat them the same. Verse 6, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment? He said, look, 
Isn't it the rich guys that are oppressing you anyways? Isn't it the rich that's, that's causing you to go through more problems? And the rich that's bringing, you know, in, in our society, isn't it the rich that's lobbying the government to, to make more restrictions and make it harder for you to start businesses and make it harder for you to do things because they want to choke you out and that they want everything for themselves? Isn't it the rich that are doing that? Like, are you blind? But yet when they come in, you're going to like bow down to them and cater to them and, and you know, worship their feet? They're the ones oppressing you. You don't give them any extra special treatment. You know, if, if uh, I, I don't know who's, fam you know who's famous around here or whatever, if, if, any, if any, you know, uh, politician or governor or mayor or whoever were to come in here, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, wow, look, you just came in the door. No. You have a seat, open seating. You know, I'm not going to treat him any better or any worse than anyone else that walks in this door. Because first of all, you're all important. Everybody here is important. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach God's word to all of you. And that's not going to change. And if I'm going to be a just pastor, a just, just preacher, I'm not going to change the message either to fit, oh, wow, this person's here. Better not say that. Better not teach this truth. That, is, that would be treating God's word deceitfully. But he says here, you know, the rich men oppress you. Verse 7, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? And how many of the, of the rich and famous blaspheme the name of God? Just openly, they don't care. They just blaspheme God's name. Verse 8, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, look at this, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. If you have respect to a, to a person based on their appearance, if you just have a respect to, to a person in general, the Bible says that's a sin. You're sinning. You are transgressing God's law. You are not to do that. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs 28. One last passage here about having respect to persons. We'll move on to the next point. But this is very interesting, and maybe you could catch this before I point it out. Proverbs 28, look at verse number 19. We're going to see here a passage that um, refers to somebody having respect of persons. We're going to start reading in verse number 19. Proverbs 28, 19, the Bible reads, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. To have respect of persons is not good. For for a piece of bread that man will transgress. He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. Now, I don't know if you notice this or not, but the, the verse that talks about having respect to persons, verse 21, is in between verses 20 and verses 22 that both are referring to a person that makes haste to be rich. Someone that wants to get rich quickly. Now, why do you think that is? If you have a respect to persons, you're looking for something from that person. Right when the rich man walks in, you're thinking, wow, here's an opportunity. Maybe I could get some of the money. Maybe I could get some, some kind of blessing from him. Maybe I could get something from him. He's already got all this money. Maybe I can figure out how to get that money like him. And you have a respect to the person. You gravitate towards that person because you want to be rich too. And you have a respect for them over, any, over other people. And... That's why, that's why I believe here in verses 20 and 22, it says, He that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You shouldn't be looking to make that quick, fast millions. You know, that's where the people go out and buy the lottery tickets, right? Because they, they want to make haste to be rich. They're not going to work and, and, and over time, you know, build wealth or anything like that. No, they're looking for the quick dollar. They say, man, I want to win a million bucks. And they, and they foolishly throw their hard-earned money away. Whatever, whatever they're making, whatever little amount they're making or a lot, whatever it is, you're throwing it away when you're buying those lottery tickets. Amen. You're making haste to be rich. And it says in verse 22, He that hasteth to be rich 
hath an evil eye. We shouldn't want to be rich. We shouldn't, that shouldn't be your desire is just to be all about money. It's a covetous attitude. And that alone is sin. And it says, it says, he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. When you haste to be rich, that's why these people who do end up winning the lottery, they do, the, the one in a million, they, they actually make it. Wow, I got this. They end up filing for bankruptcy way more often than not because they don't know how to deal with it. The poverty comes upon them. And that's why it says here to have respect of persons not good for, for a piece of bread that man will transgress. When you have respect of persons, you're looking at them, it says you're going to transgress for a piece of bread when you're looking for something from that person. No mistake there. Uh, you're in Proverbs already. Flip back to, to chapter 17. Now we're going to look at another thing besides having respect to persons being perverting your judgment. Bribes, taking of bribes. Taking of, and the Bible usually uses the word gifts. Right? It doesn't use the word bribes, but it uses the word gifts. So when you're because that's what a bribe is, right? You're saying, oh, hey, we got you this gift. You know, when when the when the lobbyists, when the big corporations are just dumping all this money into a certain candidate, right? They're expecting something in return. They're giving them a bribe. It's you know, oh, here's a gift. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, here's a way. I'll help you get into power. You remember me when you get there. And that's the way crony capitalism works today in this country. That's the way the, the, the corporations are in bed with the government. And that's why we see so many problems. And that's why we don't live in a truly free society is because we don't have a free market. We have crony capitalism. We don't have, we don't have a, a, a freedom here. Because the government is involved in making restrictions on the smaller companies to, a lot, to even be able to grow. And that's what it is. Once you get to a certain level, once you get a corporation gets to a certain point, nobody wants competition, right? Competition is a good thing for the consumer. Competition is something that, you know, people are going to try to do their best to make the best product and make it as cheap as possible and earn your, your, your vote, so to speak, as a consumer. Earn your business. But once companies start making some money, they say, you know what, I don't, want, I don't want competition. I want to be able to raise my prices and not have to worry about these people. And when corporations have a lot of money, then they can invest some of that money into saying, hey, we need this regulation. We need this regulation. We need this regulation. And does it cost them a little bit of money? Sure it does. But they have so much capital. They have already gained, amassed so much wealth that they could absorb it. They could absorb the new restrictions. They already have the infrastructure in place to be able to, to say, okay, yeah, we could... We can make this change. It'll cost us a little bit, but you know what it's going to do? These people that are, that are trying to, to win over our customers, it's going to kill them because they don't have the resources to be able to make the changes within their business and they won't be a, a competition anymore. And you know, I don't want to really get in that. It can get kind of boring with the, with the economics and stuff, but it is important to understand the way things work. And um, it all stems from the bribery. And that's where the, the corruption and the unjust, the perverted judgment comes into play. With the congressmen, with any of these elected officials that are making these laws, they're receiving gifts in order to create new laws that will be beneficial towards the person giving them the gift, and, and it's a bribe. And you can say, yeah, but it's against the law. Okay, but it's happening all the time. And the reason why is because we don't have godly judges or congressmen or whoever you want, you know, whoever is in charge of doing that. Now the Bible says here, you're in Proverbs, I had you go to Proverbs 17, right? It's Proverbs 17 verse 23 says, a wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. The Bible's calling you wicked if you are taking a gift out in order to pervert, you know, your goal is say, I'm going to give this person a gift so that they'll pervert judge, judgment. So that they'll skew it in my favor. So that they'll get whatever change I want to have happen. That's a wicked person. Now, it just so happens that we have a candidate, Donald Trump, running for president right now, who is the, the presumptive you know, Republican nominee. And I already preached this a few weeks ago. I'm not for any of the candidates. But here is a man that self-professed was participating in giving of gifts in order to get what he wanted from the politicians. And he says, oh yeah, well, they're corrupt. 
You know what? Yeah, they are corrupt, Donald Trump, but so are you. The Bible calls you a wicked man. Amen. You are a wicked man for taking a gift in order to pervert the ways of judgment. You have no integrity. You don't care about what's right and what's wrong and willing to say, you know what? If I do what's right, I may not get as much profit financially, but I'm willing to be a man of integrity and a man that fears God and I don't want to be a wicked person, so I'm just going to do what's right. That's not Donald Trump. You know what? That's not Hillary Clinton. That's not Bernie Sanders. That's not Ted Cruz. That's not any of these people. Amen. But by his own admission, here's a man that is, taking, that, is, that is giving bribes to people. Oh, they're gifts. Right? Yeah, that's what the Bible calls them too. You, know, you don't like my word bribe? Okay, we'll go with the biblical word. A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. I'm going to read for you from Exodus 23. These are kind of parallels here. Uh, Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy 16. Uh, we're going to read them both, though. Exodus 23, verse 6 reads, Thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. That means, like, corrupt the judgment. Rest is just another word. You know, like the word wrestle. You're not, you're not uh, modifying it. The judgment of thy poor in his cause. Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not. Think about that. The judge has a lot of power and authority over people, especially if you know that someone's innocent and you pervert justice, you pervert the judgment, and still allow them to go to prison anyways. Knowing that that, how wicked is that? It happens all the time. The Bible says, um, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked, and thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise, and perverteth the words of the righteous. There was just a, um, something that came to light recently, I think within the past year, so I don't know. I, my, my time frame kind of gets all skewed up with, with, with all the work that I do. But recently there were some judges that came to light that were bribed, and I don't even remember what state it was, but basically it was for um, juveniles to be sent to a detention center, a juvenile detention center. It's like a prison for kids. And what had happened was the people who built this prison system Right, because it's privately owned, and they built this juvenile detention center. They were bribing the judges to get the judges to make sentencing on children that they would send them to their facility, because they made money off of that. Right, the state has to pay them. The more the more prisoners you have, the more money they make, because the more it costs to to house them and to feed them and do everything else. So they are making money off of these prisoners. The more prisoners they have, and they say, "Wow, you know what? We could we could." Um, you know, grease up this politician over here, pay him some bribes. And it came to light recently. There was judges that were, you know, kids were getting in this, like the stupidest of trouble, right? L minor deal, something that probably all of us have done. And I, I, unfortunately, I can't think of the exact examples, but I was listening to these stories of some of these kids where it's like, their parents are like, they've gone to court with them and they're like, what? You know, like, you know, the judge is just like, well, you're guilty. You're going to this just juvenile center for like a month or two months or whatever it may be. And these kids were going and many of them were being defiled in the prison by the guards or by other kids or by, you know, they're being put in. It's kind of like when, when a, you know, a regular guy off the street gets sent into like prison prison and maybe they're innocent, they're getting framed and then they're going in there among these real hardcore criminals. Then the bad things that happen in there because you're around a bunch of animals. It was happening to kids over nothing. And, and how wicked is that? And the judge, just because he wanted that money, because he took bribes, he knew it was wrong. But he was blinded. The gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. Here in Deuteronomy 16, look at verse number 18. Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates. So this is God's plan. He says, you need to have judges and officers. We have that today. We have judges and we have officers, right? The officers go out and bring the people to the judges, right? That would be what their, what their job would be. We have judges and officers, shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. 
Thou shalt not rest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So again, it's basically saying the same exact thing as Exodus 23 did, but it's repeated here, look, don't take gifts. And think about it, when people give you gifts, just think about it in your general life. Now, I'm not saying that if somebody wants to give you a gift that you just can't accept any gift from anybody ever. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about bribery, right? This is talking about someone giving a gift in order for your But if you're a judge, that's why there are laws in place that like, you know, politicians can't personally accept money from people that while they're in that office, you know, you can't accept funds from these corporations and stuff. Because that will pervert their judgment. Because normally when people give you gifts, you have a much more fond view of them. You are going to think about them as much more friendly. Now there's nothing wrong, with, you know, especially with family and friends and stuff. Yeah, give gifts to you. You love each other, right? And sure, build a great relationship and give gifts to each other. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you are in, an, in, in a position and you're a judge, and you know, honestly... I know other pastors don't necessarily do the same thing, but like even as a pastor of this church, I don't like accepting gifts. Now, small things, a little thing here, a little thing there. You know, I don't. I don't also don't want to offend people by just not accepting something. But if someone wants to give you like a big portion of stuff, I, I kind of balk at that because I don't want my judgment to be perverted, right? I don't want to be thinking too much of someone and what if I find out that someone's doing something maybe someone's doing you know a church member that's given all this money and all this stuff I find out they're doing something that's worthy to be kicked out of church right I need to make sure that I'm able to be a just pastor and be able to say because this is my realm of authority to be able to execute God's justice and God's judgment and be able to say you need to go but I gave you all that money you need to go because this is what's right. This is God's judgment. And, and to not be afraid of, of the face of man or anything else, that is, that is what uh, needs to be done. And the Bible says if you accept gifts or bribes, then, um, and there's kind of a fine line with that because this really is talking about people who are bribing in order to pervert judgment. And it's kind of known on both levels. Like the judge that I mentioned that's going to send kids to that prison and he's accepting money for it. That's the type of gift which is different than just somebody who says, hey, I think you're doing a really good job. Thank you. Here's a nice gift. Like Pastor Anderson recently and his family was sent on vacation, right? People gave money and all this other funding and stuff to help them go on a gift. There's nothing wrong with accepting that type of a gift. That's just people acknowledging your work and stuff. It's different than saying, someone coming to you and saying, you know what? This would be a perfect example of, some, of a gift that you should not accept. Someone coming up to you and saying, I like your church. I've got a lot of money that I'm going to give you. I think, well, if, I, you know, if I stick around, we'll be out of this building. We'll be able to build this brand new building. Right? We'll be able to have ads everywhere. Your church is going to grow so big. And I'll fund it. But the only thing you've got to do is you've you got to stop preaching on the sodomites so hard. You, you, you have to stop doing that. I cannot be coming here if you're going to be doing that. That's a gift. That's a bribe. Because that is going to cause you to pervert judgment. And that is wicked and that is wrong. And in that example, I don't think I differ with that, hopefully with any pastors. None of the ones that I know of, at least. Obviously, the, the Joel Osteens are already wicked. But um, that would be the, an example within the church of something that you want to do. And that would be taking a bribe. Now, uh, turn if you would. To your, are you still in Proverbs or no? I have you turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 16. Go back if you would to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. We're going to see another, another uh, perverting of judgment, a cause for a perversion of judgment. We've already said being a respecter of persons and taking bribes. Uh, Proverbs 31, we're going to see alcohol. Alcohol will pervert your judgment. If you are, you know, any, any type of, of judging that you're doing, if you're drinking alcohol, it will pervert your judgment. Proverbs 31, verse number 4 says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel. So you're someone that, that is in a, a position of judging people, a king, right? It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. 
I'm saying, here's a warning. If you decide to drink, you could drink and forget the law. Now look, you don't even have to be a king to drink and forget God's law. That could happen to anybody. It says, lest you drink, don't get involved with alcohol because you might drink, and once you get drunk, you're going to forget God's law. It's going to go out the window. You're not going to be thinking about it anymore. Why? Because you're going to be walking in the flesh. You're feeding the flesh. You're giving your flesh that desire, that, that fleshly desire of getting drunk. And it's going to open up the door to more walking in the flesh and committing the sins of walking in the flesh, which is fornication, adultery, lasciviousness. You know, all the, the whole list goes on and on of being in the flesh. And it says also you'll pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. You, you don't think straight. When you're not sober, you're not going to be able to make a proper judgment according to God's law. Flip back, if you would, to Proverbs 23. Of course, very well-known passage on drinking alcohol. Proverbs 23. At the end of the chapter there, verse number 29. Proverbs 23, 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself at right, they're describing alcoholic wine as opposed to grape juice. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Your heart's going to be perverted from alcohol. It will corrupt your judgment, your better judgment, married man, that says... I'm not going to look at that woman. I'm not going to have lustful thoughts after another woman other than my wife. Yeah, go ahead and get drunk and see what happens. The Bible says, thine eyes shall behold strange women. You're going to start looking on those, on, those, on those women. Your heart's going to be perverted and start having perverted thoughts in your heart. And your judgment is going to be corrupted. It's going to be gone. Your better judgment. And that's what, you know, unfortunately, that's what happens all too frequently is that a lot of um, adultery takes place as a result of people getting drunk, of people going to parties or people going out to the bar or whatever, and they lose their good judgment skills and they act impulsively and they do things that they never would have done had they not been drinking because their judgment is perverted. Their judgment is corrupted. They don't judge the matter properly. The last point I'm going to make, and we'll close with this, Matthew chapter 7, is hypocrisy in judgment. You don't want to be a hypocrite in your judging. And this is what Matthew 7 is all about. For all the people who have no idea what the Bible is talking about when it says judge not. I mentioned this already earlier this morning, but we'll go a little bit more in depth as we look at Matthew 7. We read the end of Matthew 7 this morning. We're going to read the beginning of Matthew 7 tonight. Matthew 7, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. This is a warning. This isn't, this isn't necessarily a, uh, you know, a cause for you to have perverted judgment, but this will help you to keep the right judgment. When you remember that whatever it is that I judge, if I'm guilty of the same thing, it's going to come back to me, right? So it keeps you a proper judgment. And it's not just to be soft on all sin, but it's just, look, you can, you can judge, but with whatever judgment that you judge, it's only fair that would come back to you the same way. And verse 3 says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Now, older words, right? But a moat is just a real small speck of something, you know, a piece of dust, a little, little eyelash or something like that. Someone's got this real small problem in their eye. And you're trying to fix that, and you've got like this, this big rod coming out of your eye, right? This big, you're just like, hey, let me help you with that. And you're walking around like, Bunk, oh, sorry, hold on, <laughs> let, me, let me get in there. That's not the guy you want helping you out. And if you have that problem, you know, and you're going to try to judge, oh, I'll, I'll, I could fix things for you. I've got good judgment. I can see exactly what your problem is. I, I could see just fine. And you've got this big thing coming out of your eyeball. 
No, you can't. And that's what the Bible is saying. Like, don't be a hypocrite. When you've got these big problems in your life, you fix them. Because you're not going to be able to, you, you are in no position to, to, okay, to tell the woman that comes in wearing pants, you need to be wearing a skirt, you need to be doing this. And you're like, just came from the bar, right? And you're a drunk. And you're, and you're looking on strange women and you're, oh, but, but you need to be wearing a dress. Look, <laughs> that is a speck. That is a moat. That is a very small thing compared to your sin of having this big old beam of drunkenness coming out of your eye. Very, you know, world of difference there. So when we judge, we need to make sure, one, that we're not judging hypocritically and that we just have all these big problems before we open up our mouth and start to judge. And, um, well, here, let's keep reading. Verse number four, it says, Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote from, of thy brother's eye. Now, again, and the Bible's very clear here, saying, he's not saying never help the person get that little thing out of their eye and judge them, excuse me, and show them that, hey, you actually have a problem and I can help you with it. Let me point it out to you. Yeah, it's right here. Let's help remove that. But first, you need to be seeing clearly. You need to get your own eyes looking right and justly before you go and try to help anybody else. And that's what this uh, passage is teaching. Judge not that ye be not judged. Last place we're going to turn to, Romans chapter 2. We're talking about hypocrisy now. It's the last point. We've already talked about being a respecter of persons, taking bribes, drinking alcohol, all things that will pervert your judgment. And the last thing is we don't want to be hypocrites in our judgment, that we would um, be, be careful to maintain integrity in our judgment. Now, of course, Romans 1, we all know Romans 1, that goes over the... Um, the, the qualities or the, the characteristics of a reprobate and, and how wicked and filthy and, you know, and all the things that, that chapter 1 just ends with that, that, that long list of, of all of the, the wicked attributes of a reprobate. But then chapter 2 starts off, look at verse number 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. So this is talking about a person who is doing the same things that were listed above, but is judging against them. You say, oh, no one would ever do that. Yes, they do. Let's keep reading here, though. I want to read verses 2 and 3. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? He's saying, you know, do you really think, you who, who takes it upon yourself to judge someone else, that you're doing the exact same things, you think you're going to escape judgment? You think God's going to just let you go? Not a chance. And you say, oh, who would ever want to do that? How about the, all the Republican senators and congressmen that you read about that are, oh, they're these ultra-conservatives and they're, you know, they're against all the sodomy and they're against all this stuff because they're giving lip service to the people, to their constituents, what they want to hear. And then it comes out later that, yeah, they're caught being a pervert in the men's bathroom somewhere. And you read about, this happens like every year, every, every couple of years, that these people that are these so-called great conservatives that are standing for the family and they're standing against homosexuality, they are perverts themselves. Yep. And they're the hypocrites that are standing up and saying all this stuff, look, the judgment's going to come upon you, hypocrite. But see, people will read this and say, oh yeah, see, you shouldn't be condemning them, you shouldn't be judging them. I'm not a homo. Okay, I don't have this secret life of being a sodomite. <laughs> So I can judge it because I'm not a hypocrite in judging that. And any other pastor that's <laughs> not a homo can judge on this or any other person for that matter. If you're not a reprobate, you can judge it because you don't have, you're, you're not being a hypocrite. This is referring to the hypocrites that come out. And look, those hypocrites do a lot of damage to the just cause. Because that's where people start to, to say, oh, yeah. And, that, and that's why people say, oh, well, you must be one because you're so against it. 
like these other people, right? They want to put you all in the same camp because you have a few weird perverts that were just these greedy politicians that, that happen to live in an area where if they say these things, it's going to get them elected. So they'll say whatever they want because they're whores and whoremongers and they're willing to, they have no integrity whatsoever. They'll just say whatever is popular and go off and live their own filthy, wicked lifestyle in secret. But on the outside, they look great, right? Just like the Pharisees, the wolves in sheep's clothing. They want to look good on the outside. And they'll say whatever it is that'll, that'll please you. And just like the false prophets, too. I mean, think about the Catholic priests. Same thing. Just like the Republican senators. You, know, you have these, these false prophets. They're caught as pedophiles. Yet they'll stand up and say how all that stuff is immoral and wrong. They're hypocrites. And they should not be judging because God will judge them according to the same judgment. Now, this is one of the problems in this country with all of the judgment, all, all of the different areas where, where judgment can be perverted and, and can be corrupted. And this is why I don't vote because those people that are in our office are the ones that are doing the judging. I mean, in a way, when they create the laws, when they judge over people, they are doing the judges. Our judges are corrupt. Think about when you have a Supreme Court that allows for the murder of innocent children, that they get together and they say, they're going to make a ruling and say, you know what? Abortion's okay. Abortion's legal. Only under this trimester or whatever. Their judgment is perverted. They're wicked. I'm sorry, but that is not someone I want judging over me. But that's, but that's what's in our land today. Their judgment is perverted. When you have these politicians taking bribes, and they make millions upon millions. And it's interesting, if you've ever seen the numbers of politicians, they, they, they because they're supposed to be able to um, show their tax returns, right? At, when, they're, when they're up for election and people want to see, well, what are your tax returns? How much money do you make? And they show how much money they make prior to getting elected. And then they make millions upon millions of dollars in office as a result of their you know, insider knowledge and being able to make the laws and get these bribes and everything else. The per, their judgment's perverted. When you see them, I mean, literally, when you have a politician that, that makes maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year prior to becoming a politician, and then all of a sudden they're just making millions of dollars, their judgment's perverted. Oh, I just got lucky in the stock market. Yeah, right. <laughs> when you have these hypocritical congressmen pandering to the religious constituent and then getting busted as a pervert, their judgment is perverted. And you know what? If it's not one, one thing, it's another. If it's not the, the, the money and the bribes, it's the hypocrisy. If it's not that, it's the, um, you know, whatever. It's their, it's their own wickedness that, that is uh, perverting their judgment. Our system's broken and the people are wicked. And I won't vote for a person, or excuse me, the people, the people of this country are wicked. Which is why our morality is declining. And they won't vote for a person with integrity that actually looks to God's laws for justice, which is why I don't vote, because there is nobody that is, that is standing up there saying, I believe God's word is truth and that I will do all of my judgment according to what the Bible says and teaches. If you had someone that was able to stand up and say that, that had integrity, that would be someone worth voting for. But someone like that is never going to go anywhere it's because people don't want that because they're wicked. They don't want God's righteous laws in their lives. They don't want it. That's not what they want. And the people are going to get what they want when they vote. If the voting is even works. And then there's a whole nother, there's a whole nother topic, which I'm going to get into. Because even if someone were to get, get elected or, or you know, get the popular vote, I don't think the establishment would allow them in anyways to change anything or to do anything. So we need to make sure that, that we keep for ourselves free from, from the influence of our judgment being perverted. Whether it be because we're respecting one person over another, we need to keep ourselves in check over that. Whether it be because a bribe, it's going to be unlikely that you're probably going to have to deal with taking a bribe. But you never know. I mean, someday you might be in some position somewhere where, where someone's going to want to influence you to do something that's not right. Uh, you need to make sure that you're not um, tempted and, and get involved with bribe taking. We need to make sure that definitely alcohol is not a part of your life at all. 
to pervert your judgment because that, what, no matter what position you're in, that will ruin your life. That will destroy your life. If you're trying to live a godly life, drinking alcohol will destroy your life. And finally, let's not be hypocrites. Let's get people to actually listen to what we say because we don't have a big old beam sticking out of our eye and we don't look like a clown trying to help everyone else out and judge everyone else when you've got this, this major problem coming out of your own eye. So hopefully that helps. And also remember to just keep those, all these attributes and things in mind if you do vote and if you are looking for someone to be a ruler or a judge or someone who's going to provide some kind of judgment over you, even according to Romans 13, if you're looking for someone like that, keep these things in mind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your great words of wisdom. Lord, uh, justice and judgment is such an important topic, dear Lord. It's important that we understand where the, the truth comes from, that, that you are the judge, that you provide the morals for us, dear God. And we pray that you would please help us to be wise. Help us not to have our own judgment perverted, dear Lord, through these, these various means that we discussed tonight, dear God. And I pray that you would please help us to have the integrity to make the right choices and to be able to always be focused on what your will is and your righteous judgment as opposed to what our own will would want or think, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.